Want another one? You're just fucking with me. <laughs> Tarek. You... Oh my God. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome <laughs> to, to episode number 71 of the Carmudgeon Show. This is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. My name is Jason. Mary. Space. Camisa. Oh, is it Marie? Mar Mary. Jason Space Mary Camisa. This is Derek Tam hyphen Scott. Uh, I think you've said everything that needs to be said. No. In this episode, we talk about Maserati and... It's long history of sucking. <gasps> and that's, that's uh, harsh. perhaps the question of whether Maserati should continue to exist. And also when was the peak of Maserati when they were doing their most magnificent work. Uh, and then for some reason we talk about like Tesla and Saab for a while. And Rolls Royce and whatever. Rolls Royce Ooh. and that's whatever a other th topic wanders across the, the screen. No, this is all about brand positioning. The yes. idea is Maserati has maybe a muddled mission right now. We're not exactly sure what Maserati's products are mean. And we come to a, an agreement halfway through. Uh, hold on. I completely contradict myself halfway through the episode where I'm like, Maserati should be making A and that failed. So maybe they should be making not A. Um, so yes. this will be this is a fun episode, a fun adventure, and then we should also mention that we are doing a Q and A episode. Yep. So submit your cues, and we will maybe a them to video questions at haggerty dot com. You could probably also put something in the comments below if you put you a good question. Could also do that, but then we'd have to like read the comments, and then they'll. Be I read like the comments. Pitchforks. No, the Maybe. comments are great. It's where people make fun of me for being me, and they make fun of you for being you. It's so fun. Yay. Yep. Questions. Video questions at Haggerty.com. Enjoy episode 71 of the Carmudgeon Show, part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. I'm just going to make you clap again. This is all being recorded and can be used against you. Great. Hmm? In a court of law. Or a court of VCB. I didn't do anything illegal. What vehicle did you... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> this is going to be a long episode. What vehicle did you ride here in? A motorbike. And you didn't do anything illegal? <laughs> Why are you trying to... I plead the fifth. It's good enough for... You're uh, not allowed to plead the fifth. This isn't a court of law. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, it's a freaking podcast. Just say you drove like a... Saint. <laughs> we know that's not the a case. Christian uh, missionary. school teacher. You drove a missionary position? All right, <laughs> I think we... I don't know if we can use this intro. Uh, we, I think we cannot. Probably not. <clears throat> you can start it however you want. Remember, this is post-bumper. We've already told everyone what we're talking about. Right, so we don't have to say what episode number it is or any of that business. It's probably better we don't because then we're held to it. Like, you know, welcome to... The Carmudgeon Show, and we decide halfway through we change Episode the name of it. Episode of N plus one. <laughs> yes. Which yeah. is always the correct number of cars to own. N plus one. No. N minus two at the moment. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Everyone many. is always saying that the right number is one more than you currently own. Uh, I currently am at 11. You haven't can... bought or sold anything in the last however long. But welcome back, by the way. You had a little bit of a coffee cough or something. <laughs> <laughs> don't now I'm gonna, <coughs> here's yeah, yeah so we owe our listenership an apology i know two Especially, weeks without they're like weeks. did you guys get canceled again get canceled i got sick yes you know this whole like i think this i'm calling this like we've had covid19 and this was now my covid 2022 i um forgot what it's like to get a cold and what i then i so i was traveling a lot and so background story the last seven weeks were insane they were like 80 hours red a week. line red line no way past red line like past fuel the cut fuel off. cut oh yeah way past this was like you, you downshifted into second at 85 miles an hour yeah and then gave gas and put nitrous in and put a turbo on it the problem when you do what you love is that there's no delineation between work and play and so your answer to everything is yes like i want to do this i want to do that i want to do this and i packed my schedule so f full and so solid from july until now october uh that i wound up getting sick on one of the flights outbound i think i picked something up and then i was at a wedding and on my way home 
I get on the plane and I'm like, I knew I was getting sick. So I had an N95 on, but it was just like, I just like glands and whatever, you know how it starts. And during the course of that flight, it went from escalated. I, Remember that scene in the movie Airplane where this woman who's hysterical, she's yes. like, I just gotta get out of here, I gotta get out of here. And then everyone starts lining up to beat the shit out of yes. her. It's like the one person. The, and then the the father, right, the the priest comes in and he's like, no, no, let me try. And then no, he's just, let came, me try. Or is it? The, no, 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 yes, yeah, yeah. And, just shaking and then the camera sort of pans back and there's and a line of like, people. One of the guy's got a monkey wrench, somebody's got a baseball bat, somebody's got a gun. Everyone yes. wants to fucking kill her. That was me on that flight. It started with like, oh, sniffles. sniffles. And I had a box of tissues that I had bought earlier that day when I'm like, ah, I think I might be getting sick in my laptop bag. During the course of <laughs> that six hour flight, I went through an entire box of tissues. The fucking snot was, and it was <sighs> sneezing and coughing. I thought the woman next to me was just going to like shank me. She's and, probably dead now. She's probably dead. But I kept my mask on. <coughs> but I, so I landed, I went, I went, landed at LAX and went straight to uh, a CVS, some pharmacy. And I got like uh, puffs plus with lotion because I was going to be on camera. And I'm like, I don't need to have like, you know, like the sores on my nose from blowing my nose and NyQuil. And I'm like laughing. I'm like, this is what it's like to get a cold. We all forgot because no one's gotten a cold in a couple of years. Thank you, COVID. And I went to bed thinking nothing of it and woke up in the middle of the night in that fever chills. Like, oh. And I was like, this isn't a cold. You're not supposed to get chills from a cold. Oh, my God. It kicked the shit out of me. And it's been now 19 days, 18, what? I don't even know what to A long time. And the problem was I, I, two days of fever, two days in bed. I was all good. I started to feel better. And then we had three, like, 18-hour shoot days in a row and i just sort of did this gradual descent and by the end of day three i was like <laughs> and yeah and that now put me on my ass for for two weeks uh, so. welcome back you are on your ass again seating yep i'm <laughs> just checking <laughs> yeah uh i'm on so my that ass. we can uh comment about maserati that's right you want to talk about maserati i mean what's to say very early on in the Carmudgeon show, I think that when we were d describing what it was, one of the episodes, it was that why Maserati sucks and continues to suck or something. Or oh, has we did always do an sucked. episode. We talked about it, but yeah. we never did it. Mm. As a, I, I went back and checked. We never actually did that episode. So this is from like a very early ideation from three years ago about uh, a, an episode topic. <clears throat> and I, mean, I thought it was kind of apropos because, sorry, I thought it was appropriate to talk about now caught myself that time what caught yourself doing what saying words like apropos too yes. late cats out of the bag um you're an 80 94 year old dame from the 1920s yes but not uh who is that woman who just died andrew lansbury <laughs> the queen Angela lansbury um uh because they came out with a new gran turismo mm. which the, the initially i <laughs> saw it and i was like this looks an awful lot like the old gran turismo i'm not sure i'd be able to tell them apart yeah. And I think they said it was an all-new car, and I thought, all-new line of bullshit. Which is not an all-new line of bullshit, because Maserati's been on this shit for a long time. Well, so, so you're gonna, we're going to get in trouble with Maserati. I, listen, the, the, the question that I have is, should Maserati exist? That's what struck me. When you said you want to do an episode on Maserati, I thought, okay, let's answer this question first. Like, should they still be here? And what is Maserati right now? Okay. So, go. You can get yourself in trouble. Okay. Uh, Here. I'm less qualified to talk about what Maserati is today. I can tell you what I think of it. I mean, I have the last Maserati that I liked was the Quattroporte 5. Mm. I mean, I did a whole episode on that car yeah, in yeah. this very studio. Okay. Yeah. Let's just, and, and I think that is the most recent time when Maserati was like, ah, oh, yes, that is a clear vision of what Maserati is. And it's really compelling and it's unique. You know why, right? Because um, it was a Ferrari, effectively. It was uh, uh, that Quattroporte Five was the brain chart, the child of a man named Luca Cordero de Montezemolo, and he's Enzo too. I mean, I people people are gonna get upset by that, but I think he really actually was a better Enzo than Enzo was in a lot of ways, right? Yes. So that's maybe not a high bar. Oh, I, look, Enzo did create the mystique of Ferrari. He did. Right? He did. <clears throat> but he uh, bulldozed a lot of people in the process and was, he would be, I mean, he would be roundly canceled today if Enzo existed. Probably. And, Although but, and, Horatio Pagani uh, has not of, been. Exactly. And he is a large personality in the same, similar you, way. You can be a large personality, but 
I, I, I don't like the cancel culture. I think, I think the wor- the fabric of the world is wonderful when we have people who are on, not exactly in the middle of every, uh, guardrail or outside of the guardrail. <laughs> No, a Venn diagram is what I was going to oh. guardrail when they're smacking. The, no. All right. So what Enzo did was create this legend, right? But what De Montezemolo did was create the, the road car legend at the end yes. of the day. And commercialized it successfully. Absolutely. Everything we know about today's modern Ferrari is a direct descendant from what Montezemolo did. And that's in the creating this mystique, whether sometimes it was not fully deserved and maybe it was more fabricated marketing than it was real real engineering at times it worked at times but it's, there was also fundamentally sound stuff underneath case in point quattroporte five right i mean where else could you get especially imagine you let's go back to the early 2000s i mean every other sedan was a front engine with the transmission in the front and sort of just very conventional car and they come out with this concept where you're just like this is so outrageous. I mean, no one has done anything like this since Alfa Romeo did last decade. <laughs> is that really the, that was the previous transaxle sedan? Transaxle sedan before was the Alfa 75? Yes. Wow. That's a long time. Well, and like I, how many transaxle sedans have there been? I mean, we did an episode about transaxles. Yeah. There I mean, there was many. a Buick in the early 60s, the like Electra Special or something, or with Pontiac Tempest. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking of the origin of the Rover V8. Uh, and uh, Lancia did it as well. But like nobody else has ever made a transaxle sedan that I can think of offhand without having done any research. We already did this episode. We don't have to go, <clears throat> go back and find it. On but it. The, the point of that is that I think that the, the Quattroporte 5 offered something genuinely unique and like compelling and exotic and exciting. I mean, it, it was an altogether more exciting product than you could get from any other manufacturer of a big sedan. Right. Uh, and the car had a level of soul and sort of like a logical extension of the Ferrari concept to a more practical, daily usable, notwithstanding 8,000 mile clutches in the Cambio Corsas. Um, so I think that was one of the few mistakes was that <clears throat> I think De Montezemolo or whoever made the decision took it, took a the idea of a Ferrari sedan, Ferrari luxury sedan, a little bit too seriously. And by putting that single clutch automated manual on it, that's yes, that's, you could have solved it with either a manual or with subsequently an automatic, which they which had they to like re engineer the entire damn car. But the, but the crazy thing was, they didn't move, then they then moved the transmission to the front. They could have kept it as a transaxle. Yes, I mean, like um, Porsche 928 <clears throat> had a Mercedes four speed automatic in the back. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, um, but anyway, that car to me is like the last truly special, compelling Maserati because it answers a very specific question about what is Maserati. Okay, so let's look at Maserati's lineup today because Maserati has, so they've just come out with a new Grand Coupe, which looks just like the last one, and that's a, a large-ish GT, uh, 2 and plus 2. And it's a, you could get an EV or with a 90-degree V6. V6. The Nettuno. It, for the record, it's not Nettuno because it's not Modena. It's Modena and it's Nettuno. Um, the, okay. We think. <clears throat> We think? We think. You confirm this. You're the one who... Yes, I think. Okay, he thinks. Don't blame this shit on me. Anyway, the so that's the coupe that's coming. But what's on sale right now is we have the... the um, uh, uh, MC20. Well, okay, we'll start with the sports car. MC20, which I have not yet experienced, and that's a V6-powered mid-engine supercar. Is it good? Is it supposed to be good? It's really hard to tell. I, f- I feel like there have been a lot of a lot of very lukewarm reviews, and typically when I see that, it's because people are afraid to say anything bad, and the car is just not that great. I think in this case, it's probably not that great, but I'd love to experience it for myself and find out. Of course, after this episode, Maserati might never give me a car, so uh, that may never. You happen. will have to Turo yeah, one or I, something. I'll have to. Do, I'll do whatever it takes. Um, so we have the the two sedans are the Quattro Porte, which so this QP six, I guess it is Quattro Porte six, and the Ghibli. They still exist. They both still exist. They're both still on sale. The crazy thing is I was at, I think, Road and Track. And when those cars came out, none of us ever saw them. No, I think it was a motor trend. When I, Either way, major car magazines, we never saw the cars. They, they just didn't give them to you. They didn't make any effort to put them in the hands of journalists. Either there was something going on in the PR organization or the but company knew better. But no one ever saw. I never, I never once saw a press quadruporte. Uh, I heard that there was a Q4, so the four-wheel drive uh, Ghibli. Never saw it, never drove it. I did drive a rental Ghibli once. Um, and Which I, is about the way to describe that car. It it started out, I'm never, you know, I'll never, I'll never forget seeing the banners. They were, there were billboards all over LA. And it was like, at one point, $549 a month for a Ghibli turned into like, 
$219 a month. They were doing everything they could to sell these cars. And the problem wasn't that it was bad. It wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. The problem is it had no identity. All of a sudden, it didn't look like anything special. It didn't look like a QP, you know, QP5, certainly. I mean, yeah, I think that the people who bought them were people who... How do I say this? They were brand whores who were yes. trying to do something yeah. different than BMW or Mercedes. Correct. On a budget. Yes. And so you could, for $500 a month, you could have a Maserati, which sounded like it was more special than... Yes, it sounds exotic, and it. Uh, to, but for people who are not... Um, I don't know, discerning enough to sort of be like, this is meaningfully better. They feel like it's better and therefore it is better. And I mean, this is something we talk about with some regularity, which is that all like modern cars are functional and good enough that you are now at a point where just like, I don't know, it's a car, it functions like. And that's, and that, so, so then there are two SUVs, which is a perfect segue to that. Levante and then Grecale. I haven't driven Grecale yet, but Levante is not bad. It's actually quite a, quite a nice SUV. The question that I would ask is, who is the buyer for that car and why are they purchasing this over something else, right? And I think it... Somebody who doesn't want to be another damn Audi driver. But then it's got to be better than an Audi. And it's not. No, it doesn't though. Because then they're like, it's as good, but it is more interesting. Yeah, it's got to have more personality. Yes. And that would, that's the problem with the current Maserati lineup. Is it's got that, a trident on it. That's personality. No, it's not. Just know, because it breaks down. <laughs> they're not uh, they're not unreliable now, are they? I don't know. I don't I don't think we have enough data on that because I don't think they've sold enough cars. And I genuinely, that's not a dig. I mean, when was the last time you saw a modern Maserati driving around? I used to see them when the Ghibli first came out because they were like pretty inexpensive. Right. And you were able to get... The fact that they're all gone four, year, four years later is not a good sign uh, to reliability. I just don't... I'd, occasionally you'll see one. I would love to drive a Trofeo, you know, V8, supercharged, whatever the fuck it is, crazy one. They don't... They just kind of don't exist. And so I think you either have to be so fundamentally good, like a Tesla, for example, or a Lucid, you know, some of these, the new... The new competitors or you have to have a tremendous amount of personality to make your appearance and a v6 supercar is not going to do that for maserati i think you know the, the rest of the v6 ghiblis were the big problem you know v6s are not so there's so many people get so mad about this but they're just not luxury motors and they're not sports car motors they're a, an engineering solution that no one really wants but they'll do because they have to and that's not a way to make a, a name for yourself maybe now that's true I don't think that that was always true. Certainly. Dino. Yeah, but Dino was also the redheaded stepchild of the Ferrari lineup for years and years and years. It was so redheaded yeah. and so stepchildly that Ferrari wouldn't even put his name on it. Yeah, but if you interact with one now, it's actually of all the vintage Ferraris, it's probably one of my favorites to drive, if not my favorite to drive. I haven't driven one, but I, I will I mean, take conceptually, your, it's so right. similar to the car you have. That's part of the reason why I like the 308 GT4 mm -hmm. so much is because I was like, oh, it really reminds me of a 246. I'd really like to drive a 246 and I'm genuinely scared that I'll like it so much that I'll want one because there's no way I can afford one. But that said, I mean, I think the original NSX would have been a very different, very different success story if it had a V8 in it or a straight six or some other. Look, philosophically, what is a car other than it's a four wheeled device to contain an engine? Yes. That's all it is. You sound like Enzo Ferrari. Why did he say that? He's all like aerodynamics are for people who don't know how to make engines it. with any horsepower. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're really, the, what's the defining characteristic of any car? Well, certainly if it's an Italian car, it's the engine. Yeah, almost it, most of the special cars throughout history, the defining characteristic has been the engine. And look, Maserati had a 4 can Citroen V8. DS. That is one of the one of the legendary, one of the sort of icons of the, of the history of the automobile that has nothing to do with the engine. Yeah. It's okay. Every other damn part of the car is it's an 11. That shit. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and look, Maserati made itself with that V8. Which one? The quad cam, the original one. Or didn't they have one? Oh, the one in the 50s. Yeah, didn't they? Yes. Didn't that defined the company? For yes, and they had a wonderful twin cam 6 in the beginning, and then they went to a wonderful quad cam V8 that was used in the 450S, and then they put it in every damn car they made until the uh, early 90s, late 80s. I don't even in know. In the Quattroporte yeah. 3 <clears throat> was probably the last car to use that engine. What did QP4 use? It used a 3.2 liter twin turbocharged V8. It's like a, mm. probably a... Uh, <clears throat> and they, nothing no. no relation to the to the why do we have a do we have a buzz i have a buzz a buzz yeah you got a little buzz you got a little something uh, who knows it's some phone. power cord somewhere sorry guys you're very attuned to that i would never have noticed really it's now only on me it's, noticed. it's not on you spot you speak for a second 
I'm speaking for a second. Yeah, it's only on me. So it's, I have You're something buzzing. buzzing. Maybe it's your cold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sick anymore. I'm done with that. I think it, I, well, whatever. I don't know. We can make, uh, make Paula work on it. In the or background. the listeners can <laughs> just enjoy it. There's no buzz here. Um, so in the, uh, yeah, so, in the, so that engine lasted, I think, until the Quattroporte 3 ended, which I think was 1990, that original quad cam engine. But they put it in the Quattroporte 1, mm -hmm. Quattroporte 3, and then it was in all those 80, the 70s. And which is the least cars. successful Quattroporte of all time? The 2. Because it had a what? No, that's not why. It, it had a V6 successful. in it. Yeah, yeah it would have been it far the, more. Yeah, it had the V6, which was in the Merak. Uh, which was not nearly as successful as the Bora, which was the V8 version of they the same car. They didn't properly put that car in production. I know, I'm kidding. The, the I'm just trying to beat up on V6s. Yes. So, I mean, <laughs> the question you asked earlier is, should Maserati exist? And your hypoth it sounds like your answer that you have arrived at is maybe no. No, 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 no not necessarily. Okay. I, I, I loved... I love the way Maserati positioned itself in the Montezemolo era. Year, era. That's the, that is what Ferrari should be badging its Puro Sangue, the SUV, should be a Maserati. And it should be, you know, I think Maserati, owning Maserati gave Ferrari the ability to expand in its lineup. Without having to move down market themselves. Right. Send and, someone in to do your dirty work. Well, right. I think, I mean, Jaguar Land Rover is a perfect example, right? Jaguar's sedans, and it should have stayed that way or should have stayed something other than SUVs, and Land Rover should stay SUVs. I mean, Land Rover making a sedan would be stupid. And apparently yeah. they made the calculation that to slice and dice the market that way made sense, because we have these Jaguar SUVs. Right. Which I mean, at this, have appreciably different identities, apparently, from Land Rover. It's, that's a real, it's a big shame, because Jaguar strangled the sedans. Look, sedans are dying off. It is the way, it, it's just the way it's going. I mean, but, it, yeah, it's we're now in an era of SUV or die. Except what, what just debuted this week, the Cadillac Lyric? Which is a sedan. Lyric, it's the Celestic. Celeste, sorry, sorry, Celestique. Um, that's a sedan too. So I think they're, we're going to see. Yeah, the, but I mean, they're going to sell six of those anyway. They're $300,000. But still, I think you, my, the, you're right. Yes. The point is, though, that the pendulum always swings the other way. And when we're dealing with an electric future where, where frontal area is of concern for aerodynamics. I feel like we've been in like a, just a continuous march of SUVdom for... 25 years yeah and we'll continue for a while but the pendulum will start you start, think so yeah i think you start to see I, you have it to, is so ingrained in consumers that suv is desirable and not suv is not i think there's and i think there are a bunch of reasons for it one of which is the economics of it right i mean the u.s government has decided to favor suvs and fuel economy emissions and crash which makes them easier for car companies to build i mean i talked about that in the in the k car episode yes <clears throat> that the k cars you know are a result of legislation passed in japan to encourage mobility for small cars and we did the same thing in the opposite direction by just encouraging Large SUVs. Cars, yes, yeah. suvs and so i just think yes consumer tastes are right now for suvs but at the end at the at the at the end of time will they stay that way sure suvs have some advantages but some disadvantages and i think we'll move closer back to smaller lower cars not smaller lower cars i hope you're right but i don't share the same optimism we'll see. it's a it's a representation of my faith in the car buying public my the, lack of faith in the car the problem that public. i have is right now sedans have no way of being pretty so once you go electric you can't do that look at what uh polestar 2 looks like I mean, Polestar 2 is not because it's based on a truck, right? It's based on, the, but they should have come out with Polestar 3 first, which is an SUV, right? They just made a sedan based on an SUV. Even Tesla Model 3 is dork machine. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, that thing is just hideous, right? But Model Y is better. And it, it, it's, be, it looks like a toad. They're both it, ugly. They're, they're both, I would rather look at the three. Uh, right. But fair I'd enough. I'd rather look at neither. I'd rather, I'd rather own a Y though. They're just that much more practical. That's the problem. This is why everyone goes to SUVs because I want to hatch. That's why I own a Golf. Because um, that, that really is the best of all worlds, except I can't go off-road and do all the other stuff that people don't actually do in their SUVs. Anyway. The, the other thing also that happens is that the dynamic shortcomings of SUVs have been basically whittled away to nothing. That We've now been able to make everything dance. You know, I mean, if you look at macan i mean every suv just if you look at the old days and it's talking about the early 90s when you talk, uh, let's see like the acura slx or the isuzu trooper or well, the fucking the explorer, explorer that flipped over when you looked at it yeah well those were the tires apparently yeah it isn't it's never one thing 
Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, but top the, heavy. Increasingly, like people back then were like gravitating towards SUVs, even though they were meaningfully worse in significant ways because they weren't unitary construction and they were inefficient and they were. We still are. Look at the G Wagon. Yes. I mean, the most desirable SUVs, as far as I'm concerned, are are things like the G Wagon, Defend, Land Rover Defender, yeah. all of which are boxes. Things that are honest and authentic about what they are, as right. opposed to like pseudo car like, like, which is a thing that. Porsche Cayenne embodies or Macan or I, the Maseratis. And or, I just had a Cayenne. And I got to tell you, I, I, it was a Cayenne Coupe GTS, which is the dumbest. It was an X6. What a magnificent car to drive. I hate to say it. I mean, you know, I got in I it and I just hated it right off the bat. First of all, I was sick. That was when I landed at LAX and got it and I took it over to my CVS thing. And I'm like, this thing is stupid. And then it started and I'm like, oh my God, it makes actual V8 noises as opposed to all the other German V8s that just make that flatulent you know this thing makes music and it screams and it sounds good and the steering was amazing and then i took it on a back road and the handling's unbelievable and it's just it's so good i hate that it's that this good this is why i don't think that consumers are going to return the back. problem with all of that excess is that it costs right you can make an suv dance but you're talking about two thousand dollars worth of tires every time you wear one out and they're 5800 pounds so then you're talking about you know, a five thousand dollar brake job, and it just all leads to excess after excess after excess. And it's my hope, perhaps mis misplaced, that we will try to concentrate on what we kind of need, which is not this level of excess. Which brings us to Maserati. I mean, American cars were like land yachts too, right? That's a different form of excess, but it's the same thing that underpins it, which is this American like obsession with size. And it just, it's, they, like, well, land yachts it, became, they, they took the same amount of volume and just built it up. <laughs> well, they did, there was, but there was an upside associated with that, right? You drive in a 1960s American car, and they are exquisitely comfortable. Yes. And Unless then, you get into, like, the situation where the shocks really, can never catch up, and then you just get seasick. Right. But then, you know what American drivers did? They slowed down. And so they would just drive slow. So you have these European high revving, screaming little, you know, penalty boxes that they would, you know, think of. You think, think about what it would be like to drive in American geography in, I don't know, a Cinque Tento. You've done it. <clears throat> it's miserable. I mean, that's excessive. But it, that okay. example, I mean, like a Fiat 1100 actually is also in, unusable in the United States. Basically, all European cars in the 1960s were unusable at. Yeah, unless you were in, buying a Mercedes. Right. Even so, BMWs were like, the big one was the two liter. Ooh, yeah. They just weren't, so American excess is, is a function of our geography and how far we drive and the speeds at which we drive. And 60s and American cars. And how space is not at a premium. Right. That's in most thing. of the built environment in the right. United States. That's a good point. Um, we were supposed to be talking about Italians, but in Italy where space is a premium, you need, how do we get back good to Maserati? Transition, which, where Maseratis make a ton of sense. Um, no, they don't. No, they don't. Uh, uh but yeah, so in the early days, I mean, the question for me is like, when did Maserati peak? When is the most desirable era for, of Maseratis in in your eyes? Or it? Okay. The question that <laughs> I have is: Is, is there play the sound bite of the crickets? <laughs> I don't remember how to make that happen. Is there a peak Maserati, or is there a least trough Maserati? Maserati look, Maserati has had a really tough run. I mean, has Maserati ever really been a profitable, viable business? I mean, yes, they have a habit time? of continually going out of business. <clears throat> Once they got brought into a proper corporate fold, I think that sort of becomes immaterial and it can be viewed as a, like a marketing expense potentially. I mean, in, internal or, internal organization-wise, they have to be like your organization has to stand on its own and have its own balance sheets and sort of function. I guess that's probably how they function now within Stellantis, I'd guess. This was, uh, this was a big question that I had when Piech started to to take all of the brands together for Volkswagen, right? His point was every one of the brands had to be profitable at all times. And I thought that was silly. I don't think in an economic downturn, a brand like Lamborghini needs to do as well as a brand like Skoda, which is at the bottom of the market, right? Um, so is you'll that have, the bottom? I think Skoda. In the VW group? Seat, Seat and Skoda are probably the bottom. Am I forgetting a brand? No, it's no. gotta be, it's probably Skoda. So you have, well, Seat. Probably more Seat, Seat's last gen. Either, either one of those two brands, right? I mean, you have all these brands and the, the whole idea is you've diversified so that when some one is doing well because of economic conditions, maybe the other one's not. 
you know, Jaguar Land Rover, sedans do better in one market, SUVs do better in another. I always thought that the diver diversification would help everyone. The problem was all the, the executives get greedy and they say, well, all brands have to be profitable at all times. And so Stellantis did that, not, it wasn't Stellantis at the time, but it, FCA did that with Maserati, Alfa Romeo, Ferrari, and the Chrysler and everything else. They had the same thing. So you have Jeep, which is frankly going to do well no matter what. You have Ram, which will do no, do well no matter what. But then you had, you know, historically Plymouth at the bottom of the bottom of the market, and then Dodge is a sporty brand. And Ooh. you can imagine, <laughs> well, you can imagine a world where you have enough brands that at some point the whole company, at every point the whole company, the whole conglomerate is doing well. And then you have room for Maserati because Maserati is the is the sporty. Yeah, here's Ferrari my vision for what Maserati should be. It should be doing things in a Ferrari-esque way that, that Ferrari cannot do. And there's a couple of meanings there. So that means like big cars that are four doors. And like, yes, I think I conceptually agree with you that there should not be a Ferrari SUV, that it should be a Maserati product instead. Same thing with sedans. And then there's potentially space for sports cars that are a little bit less expensive than Ferraris, maybe. As long as they're good. Well, that's the, that's the most important thing, right? Goodness. What I think is missing from Maserati's lineup is that true desirability. And it's not... Which is related to the intrinsic goodness or some sex appeal of the car. And that's, I think, why we returned to the QP5. Because there was something magical about that car. That in spite of the fact that it cost half as much as a... Well, I don't know. I guess it was probably about the same thing as a 360. Well, they were that both, expensive. Oh my they were $125,000 when they came out in 2005. Enough. That's like 360 money. All right, so you could say, <laughs> it's a 7 Series or S-Class competitor It should be 7 car. plus, right? It should be 7 slash S-Class plus in terms of price. price point. But then But it should be dynamically. Yeah, dynamically. It could be the same size, but it has to dynamically drive like a size smaller. I think, fair enough. But just blow your fucking head off with the noise and the experience and yes the, you know, and the italianness of right. it um, uh, which i think that car did a good job of doing so here's a question in that realm that you just in that world you just described where's alfa romeo because remember that was part of the part of the same company too it's it's further down i mean that's like um and it's more athletic because it's smaller. The cars are smaller. So you sort of remove the luxury and you keep the sport and then you have sort and of the, entry the, level. And you go to size down. Like, I don't know that there should be an Alfa Romeo. There certainly should be. The biggest Alfa Romeo should be the size of a 5 Series. Hmm. If that. Yeah. Uh, should Alfa Romeo make an SUV? Everybody has to. Except Ferrari? Except Ferrari. Yeah. Uh, no, Alfa Romeo can make an SUV. I, and I, I, I'm because I am an old guy at heart, I draw back on the past oftentimes. And Alfa Romeo has a history of making a variety of strange things in the past, whether that's the F3 as an ambulance or there was the, I learned about this recently, the Alfa Romeo Romeo or Romeo. It's called the Alfa Romeo Romeo. Uh, Is that like an Enzo Ferrari Ferrari? A yes, Ferrari the, Enzo Ferrari, Ferrari the Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the uh, Romeo was a predecessor of the Fiat Ducato basically, which is a van. Which is uh, no relation to Ducati, van, which is two which Ducatos, is, isn't it? Yes, or <laughs> two, at least two, more at than one Ducato. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Alfa Romeo has a history that goes back to the, and they made military Jeeps. They made the Mata, which had mm -hmm. a, an all alloy twin cam inline four in a Jeep in That's the crazy. 1950s because Alfa Romeo was like, this is our biggest engine, so we're putting it in the Jeep. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm okay with Alfa Romeo making an an SUV because there is some sort of historical basis, which is like backwards looking and insufficiently innovative. And if I, by that thinking, then the Cayenne never should have existed, but that saved the company. And, you know, I would have objected to the Cayenne existing when it came out in 03 or whatever. <sighs> That's a tough one because I still object to the Cayenne existing as much as it's good and whatever is philosophically. It was I wonder, necessary. was it? Because I when I look at that, if, if Porsche, let me ask him one question. If Porsche had doubled down on the products that it that make its image, i.e. 911 and Boxster at this point, right, sports cars, look at the sales prices of those cars. Porsche has now, fucked itself so badly. But if they had just ceased to exist in 2005 because they didn't come out with an SUV, then there would be no Porsche beyond that point. Like if the choice is Porsche with Cayenne, yeah, of course, or no Porsche existing. Of course, of course, I'm I'm 100 on board with that. But I just kind of wonder if right now, if the average sale price for for a 911 is probably along the lines of two hundred thousand dollars, 
right? Or more, especially with markups to something. Did the company actually fuck up the 9-11 lineup? No, no, no. I think they were able to preserve it. I mean, the company was able to persist and exist because they made an SUV I think they're 20 years them. ago. They're fucking themselves sideways right now. Because I mean, they're making because uh, they're because GT. the dealers are making a hundred thousand dollars on every one of the cars, and Porsche isn't, and Porsche yeah. should be making that, and the dealers absolutely should not be making that markup. That's telling me that Porsche is underpricing their cars by a hundred or one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars per unit, all of which should go back into R and D and and the materials in the car. Imagine how good the nine eleven would be if the 911 was a $200,000 base car instead of a $100,000 base car. And tell me that there's, you don't think that company would be profitable with the number of cars they sell at the real selling price if the dealers weren't, the dealers weren't pocketing that. Yeah. So I think, yeah, okay, I love where Porsche is right now. What does that have to do with SUVs? Because I don't think, I, I think Porsche got so distracted with the SUVs that they've mispriced the, the 911 and they do not understand just how good that car is they and what have, customers they, are willing they, to pay for um, it. They are doing that thing where you are devaluing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. There's no reason to have a base 911 anymore. No one wants it. You know, the you, the joke is you get the top spec Turbo S, right, which is a $200,000 car, and dealers want 100 more to 240 whatever it is. Yeah. And For dealers want 100000 over that, and they're getting it with a, with a wait list. Porsche, what are you doing? Get rid of the $100,000 911 or sell five of them as a loss leader so you can say it's starting at $99,999. Whatever it is, but concentrate on the people who are willing to spend $300,000 on a GT3. Make cars for them. Imagine how good that car would be if it's a 10 out of 10 now. Yes, That's and point. it's engineered to a base price of whatever those cars cost, yeah. 170 or right. something like that. And so I'm happy that Porsche exists, and I'm happy that Macan is great, and Cayenne is a really good, they're, they're really good. But I also think it it forced the company to take its eyes on, off the ball a little bit. And the, the 911, the sports cars are still great. But at least there is a company to take its eyes off yeah. the ball. Yep. I, I'm fine with that, but I think as a whole, right? So do you right, think Maserati has that... Maserati could if Maserati stuff was as truly as desirable as the Ferrari stuff, but is it, but in its own realm, I think it could, there, there certainly could be a reason for it to exist. I, I mean, I read some op-ed that, you know, Maserati being separated out from Ferrari gives Maserati finally the freedom to make an MC 20. No, mm. I don't think Maserati should be competing with Ferrari where Ferrari is dominant. Was that, is that's not the car that was supposed to be an Alfa Romeo, is it? Is the MC20? I don't think, I don't know. There was some car that was supposed to be a big, a 6C, effectively. A larger 4C, a mid-engine, you know, Alfa Romeo with a six-cylinder engine in it. Maybe it and is. And then they, it might have gotten hijacked by Maserati. I, this was years ago, and I don't know if that's what the MC20 ended up being. Uh, in hmm. any case, there was, historically, Maserati and Ferrari could almost be, they were rivals. Hmm. I mean, like, if you go back to the 1950s in Formula One, they were racing against each other in Formula One, and... You know, if to answer the question that we sort of danced around before and never answered, I think that sort of peak Maserati is probably the 1950s <coughs> or 1960s. Uh, Formula One world class Juan Manuel Fangio was, drove and won two drivers championships in Maseratis in the 1950s. The 450s, the 250f. I mean, the Birdcage. There are all these iconic Maserati race cars from that era when they were trying to go head to head with Ferrari that drew out the sort of most magical of their achievements. And it wasn't until that got sort of folded in to the sort of Montezemolo era, basically when it became part of the same corporate parent uh, in the 90s, I guess, that they were like, okay, now Maserati will get pushed down market. Now we all as consumers have this image of Maserati as a down market thing, as opposed to a competitor with Ferrari, which was where they originated. And that's where all their good products, like iconic products came from. So that was in the 40s and 50s, right? Uh, 50s. In, into the 60s. I mean, the Ghibli was a, the original Ghibli was a direct competitor of a Ferrari Daytona. They were both 170 mile an hour mm. uh, front engine, 300 plus horsepower cars. And like a Ghibli Spider is not that differently valued from a Daytona Spider, for example. Mm -hmm. And so into the, and the, the Maserati Bora was intended to compete with the Boxer and the, and the Mira. So up until but did it? I mean, so here's I, I uh, performance wise, it was kind of there. Why yeah. did so? What what happened? 
I guess that's uh, question. Well, they like kept trying to go out of business like everybody in the 70s. I mean, Lamborghini did this too. Mm-hmm. They went into receivership a number of times. Citroën bought them at one point, and then Citroën divested themselves of them, and then De, De Tomaso, Alejandro De Tomaso bought Maserati, and so Maserati was just getting like sort of passed around like a sickly ailing child and it was never it was like a foster child basically Dude, do people pass around sickly ailing children i mean they're my kids uh orphan my kids. I, like i'm imagining a f- of going going to like f- like a foster child that you know continuously doesn't get a forever home right. or whatever that's that really was, sad yes it is very sad i mean that's and that's why <laughs> maserati wow. like ended up in and then you know the bi turbo was a like really problematic product i mean it was commercially a sensible thing to do because they were trying to sell volume uh by making the cars be forty thousand dollars instead of a hundred or whatever wait 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 wait. you're just contradicted yourself because if you said that maserati's it was a survival technique it was an effort to to just ferrari didn't have to do that yes if you're really a competitor for here's the thing it's a self-inflicted wound you can't say i'm a competitor my glory days were when i'm competing with ferrari and then go make a knockoff e30 that sucks Right, because remember, well, this somebody is, who buys decades any- have ensued, right? right? And you have been sort of lost your way, being passed around between Citroen and De Tomaso and whoever else owned Maserati during this era. They never had the continuity and like the long-sighted investment strategy to be like, let's put a big pile of money into future growth and develop something that is an answer. To, and not to mention the environment was changing a lot then because there was the uh, the fuel crises, and I mm-hmm. think the bi turbo is probably in some sense a response to the fuel crisis as well sure. and so there it's a little bit reactive in this inability to execute on like a long-term vision that is really clear and thoughtfully architected and like visionary effectively that's a really interesting point of view because what that says is that actually the alpha Romeo, the current alpha Romeo model model which was let's really invest and go after three and five series sales right with with um the julia is actually the wrong way of going and that's what what allowed maserati to just fail continually and actually the the right thing for them to do would be to make an mc20 alpha male no the right thing for uh, for maserati i'm saying would oh. to do would to do don't go after volume sales go after the absolute top of the top because ghibli obviously didn't but there's work. no Quattro corporate Quattro. reason for that to occur now because it is attached it's at the hip to ferrari or it's in the same organization not anymore what Oh, because Ferrari is IPO'd. For, yeah, there don't are, they have some kind of corporate and like they share technical content? Like, isn't there some discussion about the Netuno being like a Ferrari engine? It so they're now separate. Core? They are now separate, and that's that's why. So the the, I, the opinion pieces that I've read of the you know Maserati's separation from Ferrari now actually allowed Maserati to bloom and have an MC20, and so. I don't think the companies are sharing anything anymore. I think, if anything, the Natuno is clearly just related. Assume there was one Italian car company because yeah. everything got folded into one company Ferrari's in the early '90s. Yeah, Ferrari, Maserati, Alfa Romeo, but it's now Stellantis. Lancia. But please, I can't keep track of who's with whom now because I mean, I always keep forgetting that Opel is PSA. Like yes. this world is like I don't know. Is it because I'm getting old? Or is it like, you tell me because you've been both young and old. I just yeah. can't keep track of who's, who's with whom anymore. So no, without question, the Natuno V6 is derived from a Ferrari V8 or a Ferrari V6, whatever it is, right? There's definitely shared componentry there. Um, is and there shared a Ferrari design. V6? Yeah. It's oh, the, t- new, the, the new yeah, 296. The 128, That's separate, right? <clears throat> I don't know. Typically, the way car companies work is they engineer a combustion chamber, right? And so... Like and the th- then you just pack it to the number of those that you would like. Exactly. So you make it, you know, three, three, four, six, eight, ten, twelve cylinder at, at an engine out of the one born stroke and whatever else. Natuno's does not share born stroke. No, it does share born stroke. Born stroke. With, it's probably related in concept. I just don't think it's it's manu- It's de- no longer manufactured by Ferrari in the way that the one five four F one five four engine was. This is the old V eight that they put into. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're definitely seeing them come apart it's funny enough though i say well maserati should be a uh should be you know doing all the cars that ferrari can't do and actually what you're saying is in history maserati was at its best when it competed directly with ferrari so maybe i'm wrong and maybe but they had a broader sort of they took in more territory i mean the the quattroporte one to me i think is a really important car nobody else seems to know or care about the Quattro Porte one, but I think that it's a really important car because it's very similar conceptually to the Quattro Porte five and that you get a really spicy V8 and a level of performance and athleticism in a sedan 
that is kind of not available elsewhere. It is, I always sort of, when I talk about the 300 SEL 6.3, I'm always like, oh, Quattro Porte 1 was out like six years earlier, six, 68 to 63, five years earlier, and is like not quite as performant, but like it's a very exotic and not really a mass selling car. But I always think about the Quattro Porte 1 as being really significant. And the engine in the Quattro Porte 1 is the 450S engine, which is that quad cam V8 that went in every damn car. Mm -hmm. Mexico, Indy, you know, Ghibli, all of those, Bora, uh, all of those iconic Maseratis. And of course, the 5000 GT, which was the like, the 5000 GT was like the car that they sold to the Shah of Iran and they made like 40 of them and they cost, it was like the equivalent of a supercar the way that a LaFerrari or MC12 uh, or, I mean, it was just an insanely high performance, 170 mile an hour car in like 1960 oh, uh, with a live rear end with a, a racing car engine. It was a sports car racing engine that they put in and sold in very small numbers at do, high prices. Do you think Maserati should have, do you think the Alpha 8C should have been a Maserati then? If we're talking mm. about Alpha as the sort of entry level of the trio. I mean, right? it kind of was in some sense. I mean, the engine is the same engine but carbon fiber chassis and like styled in a different way it's it you, you you get into conflict because these things all had the same corporate parent during this era but mm -hmm. historically the eras that these cars are supposed to hark back to they they were comp competitors effectively ferrari well so alfa romeo in the pre-war era which obviously 8c is a reference to because alpha 8c 2300 and 2900 from the 1930s uh is a time that never really existed for Alfa Romeo beyond 19, the first half of the 50s. They went away from making big cars and decided, and they did exactly what BMW did 10 years later, which is that they said, we're going to make small athletic cars and sell them in large numbers, and that's what's going to keep us from going out of business. So the Alfa Romeo Giulietta was the BMW 2002, 10 years earlier, for a different car company. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Alfa Romeo sort of permanently went in that direction, and all the iconic post-war Alfa Romeos, pretty much, are cut from that cloth. GTV... Alfetta. Right, which is why 4C makes sense for the brand. Mm -hmm. But I think 8C doesn't. 8C should have been a Maserati. Yes. In the modern context, the 8C probably doesn't. Uh, and they had to dig back to the 1930s to draw on that. I mean, obviously, the values of those cars are such that people understood what they were and are valuing them accordingly. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about this corporate hierarchy of those three companies of Alfa Romeo, Maserati, and Ferrari, then yes, it probably should have been a Maserati. Mm -hmm. It's really, I, it, it's so easy to ask the question and wonder what would it and be. And we have not answered it. We have just gone on well, yeah, ad nauseum. A, look, there's, there's no answer to this, right? I mean, I, I, should Maserati exist? Well, I certainly want Maserati to exist. I just, I'm not sure what Maserati stands like for It's like, should this point. Saab exist? You know? Yes. But Somebody's got to be fucking weird and but cold But the, the and problem Swedish. is that there's the, the volume of car, or the cost of developing a new car and the volume of cars sold makes it impossible to develop something as weird as a Saab 900. I'm, and I, sell it the I, first stop 900 I'm, and sell it to the public i'm going to disagree with you because I, i'm going to say think there would be enough architects and professors and they all drive teslas now <gasps> just blew your mind tesla is the fucking modern saab let's do everything different everything better come at this from a different industry look saab came at automobiles from the jet industry and did everything a little bit different it was a little weird and they were a little fucked up and they were a little cool and it wound up yeah, getting but they never did this huge sales volume traction thing that tesla's doing i mean tesla yes, is did. the best-selling car like isn't it the best selling what is it i love that it last last month There's, in germany tesla model y also volkswagen golf in germany i can't fuck him i was i read that headline 65 times and i'm like this can't be it's is it april 1st what's going on the golf outselled by model y Let, i don't know if it was just a you know supply chain aberration we'll find out but this is crazy town. Yes, but and whereas Saab was always in a sort of niche thing, and they cars were engineered and sold in volumes that made that they could be profitable at the relatively small volumes. They, that they were sold pretty them. big sellers. If you look at Saab nine hundred sales in the U.S. back in the day, there were six figures. A huge amount of cars. That'd be really interesting. so. When I did the the revelations on the Saab nine hundred, I said it was the Tesla of the nineteen eighties, mm -hmm. um, and I. I it's kind of a strange viewpoint, but I, as I'm sort of reading things, uh, period reviews, all, all of the journalists are making fun of Saab buyers in the same way that we're, we make fun of Tesla buyers today. Um, but it was very much a coastal elite university mm. professor, architect, blah, blah, blah. They just wanted something different. And then, you know, George Carlin was making fun of them for being, you know, I drive a safe car. Well, why would you drive a Swedish piece of shit like that for? I mean, it was, you know, it was just became a cultural thing to make mm -hmm. fun of 
it's so similar. Mm -hmm. And this was a company that was obsessed with safety and efficiency and real world speed. So like the turbos, uh, 900 turbo had a top speed early, early on. Like I think it was three miles an hour faster than the NA car, but it was five seconds quicker, zero to 60. Right. So they were exaggeration, but the idea was it doesn't matter. These are not Audubon cars. We're not German. We're what we need to do is have a car that goes in the snow and is quiet and smooth, but quick. So let's give it a tiny little turbo for quick response and great mid range torque and fuck what happens at the top end. And, you know, Tesla looks at the same thing. We don't care what happens in the Audubon top speed is not relevant to us. What's important acceleration, safety, economy, all these different ways of looking at things. And they came at a car from the tech industry viewpoint where Saab came at it from the from from aerospace. So I really think that there is a place to had to do things differently. We'll see what happens with Lucid and with Rivian and, you know, all of the other startups. I have huge hopes for both of those companies. Um, but I think there is a place in the world for for new technologies and a new way of of thinking i mean yes out. the type of thinking that i'm describing where they're like oh we're all going to make the same damn two two liter four cylinder with a turbocharger Fuck. thing happens because uh there's a lack of imagination in legacy manufacturers right. and that's what opens the door to things like tesla to occur right why so, isn't maserati the brand that becomes the electric or the electrification that you can't and don't want from ferrari Look, we're all going electric. Mm. That sucks. The, the idea of an electric supercar, sorry. I just, I, I drive an EV every day. I don't want an electric supercar. I want a naturally aspirated, high, naturally aspirated, high revving, screaming car, ideally with a manual transmission, something about experience, experience, experience. Well, what would stop Ferrari if they, if Ferrari and Maserati were the same company from sticking to what it does best, which is race cars and, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. We know everything that we know Ferrari is and let Maserati be the one to innovate. Like here's a $300,000 absolutely good. Take the lucid air and put a Maserati badge on it and Italian styling. There's your new fucking Maserati. That's exactly what that company should be doing. Not mm. making a GT that looks like exactly like the one from 15 years ago. Mm. Oh, it's electric. It doesn't matter. Yes. I mean, now that the ele there's so much mainstream acceptance of electric cars, I think there's less need to make them look like conventional cars. You should tell the Germans that. Yeah. I mean, initially, I get the understanding. That I understand that they are trying to not frighten people with too much change, but I think we're now past that point. Yeah. Look, it's just, it's people get so upset about this. It's, just, it's happening. I don't know the right answer. I don't like. I don't have a crystal ball to look through and see. Oh, in twenty years, we're going to find out that the lithium mining created more blah blah. I, I don't know. But the reality is, we are faced with the world has made a decision. We're going with electric. So this opens up the doors for companies like Maserati, like Rolls just announced. They're all this. I think car. is brilliant because it's so consistent with the image of what a Rolls Royce should be. It is, should be silent and luxurious and smooth. The fact that that last Phantom came out and wasn't electric, I could have fucking strangled every executive at, at, at Rolls Royce. How did you idiots not do this? Yes, no because one it is needs so consistent with the brand. Who drives a Rolls Royce more than 500 miles in a sitting? No one ever. These people have fucking planes for that. These are around town machines to whisk you away in complete silence. No one needed a 500 mile range. So they were prime. You don't need a V12. You don't, right. The whole point of a V12 was that it's as smooth as an electric motor. No, it's not. It's not even close. Not like, to mention the efficiency. Right. And packaging. I mean, if efficiency doesn't really matter. But here's the thing. Take a Phantom. What do you want? You want quiet power, right? Obviously, we know there's nothing as quiet as an EV in terms of you know, propulsion. And you put a foot-tall battery pack between you and the ground. And you can sit above the peasants on whom you look down already. Which you, exactly. You're already looking down on that. And that battery pack just means quiet. Yes. It's another... It's, a, it's all of this in insulation. insulation. They... I can't believe it. The fact that it took BMW this long to make an electric Rolls Royce tells me they have completely, well, it's just an indication of how fucked up that company is inside. Sorry. Right, Yet again, we first. are shitting on BMW, it which means been, that we look, have come full circle. They, they make some great cars right now and then some cars that are not great. Um, are there some great cars coming out of BMW nice. Group? Listen, that iX SUV is, is, an, is a neat rethink. I don't think it's, the ultimate driving machine by any standard but it's at least bmw maybe with, we are in a post ultimate driving machine era for we, bmw oh totally i mean like conceptually they should embrace that they should stop trying they to should pretend. stop calling it 
They should call you that. Right. They, they have come up with a new identity. I mean, they, you like, saw the not new that long ago, what, what they were doing that Freude am Fahren thing. Like that the was joy. Yeah. That, I just translated it as joy. That uh, is very gone. I'm a Freude am Fahren has been there. That's their tagline in Germany for years, decades, sorry, decades. Uh, and they tried to do it in the U.S. and it just didn't it didn't work. But I think they need to come up with something because they're just not. Besides the ultimate driving machine, right. because that is. That's not what they are There's anymore. too big of a gulf between their products and that statement. I mean, the, the only thing I can say that BMW is cons- does consistently well right now, other than building great engines, um, is. Push the limits of. Push the limits of design in every <laughs> single direction for every different product. I mean, the M2 comes out and it looks nothing like any of the other cars. Like, where the fuck did this? Did you see this car? Mm-hmm. Yes. The squared off full yeah, diaper. Yeah. The, the square. back is just an abomination. I, I'm i going to reserve judgment until I see one in person because maybe it looks good. But man, it doesn't look pretty in the pictures. But anytime you have to reserve judgment until you see something in person, that's an automatic sign that it's not good looking. Not necessarily. New Z. Have you seen a Z in person yet? No. They're great looking really really genuinely great looking and i think that horrendous. a car that is like genuinely drop dead gorgeous in person is going to look that way in photos too lucid i it looks like a jelly bean even in person mm. i say i think it looks terrible in photos and then looks quite nice in person it looks Very nice Citroen. but it's not like i i just think we're we're at a point where cars designs are so complicated and there's there's nothing straightforward they're all so over designed that you it's only in person when you when you're noticing the proportions and not staring at like weird bumper cuts and stuff that they really start to that they resemble what they real look like in the real world and uh, but anyway yeah i i i i'm saddened by maserati's current lineup because ghibli is just just please kill it just please kill it put it out of its misery it's embarrassing you a maserati shouldn't be competing with corollas on lease prices and they are I mean, I haven't looked in a while, but I mean, I also haven't seen one on the road in forever. I I think I've seen three Quattroportes. People aren't buying it. No. Literally. Levante. Gricali could could work, but again, that's a volume play, right? That's, here we go with a, you know. The Fulfilling same thing. its corporate destiny as a thing to justify its continued existence. Right. Alfa Romeo, Tonale is coming out. The same thing. This fucking front wheel drive SUV. Stop. Stop. Okay. In What Alpha's if it's defense. as good as a CX-5 or CX-3? 650 even better mm-hmm. current cx50 me sure i will i will reserve judgment because mazda cx50 is one of the best driving suvs you can buy period and it's front wheel drive based it's a it's transverse front front drive i just i'm not sure that's what no i mean alfa romeo already had a sort of misfortune experience in going a lot of front wheel drive right for so like but, 30 years but then we have to admit that we're probably wrong on this because julia and stelvio complete and total failures i hate that well it's again a self i think it's a self-inflicted wound because the cars were reliability nightmares at the beginning especially the v6 is what people were worried about right i mean you can't resurrect a brand that that left a marketplace in disgrace (laughs) exactly right 20 years earlier because it was the cars were so fucking unreliable i mean the best is the the Milano Verde. All the big magazines had a had a long term car. Only one, ma- I think it was only Car and Driver that published their long term review. The other two just never said a word about them. They all fucking caught fire. One blew an engine. I mean, they were just total disasters. And so you, the company leaves this country in disgrace and comes back. The first thing that happened was Ed Lowe, the uh, the, the uh, our editor in chief when I was at Motor Trend, broke down in a in a QV like in the middle of rush hour traffic on the 405 it was something like i I think it was 405 like 15 lane wide la highway and just died bricked itself wouldn't start wouldn't come out of park had to be had to sit there and block traffic for hours until they could drag him off the roadway that's not the way to restart a brand in the u.s and so you know it doesn't matter how good julia is or stelvio it doesn't you can't have that kind of start and think you're going to resurrect yourself and Maserati coming back with a, you know, like Maserati's back with a Quattroporte and, and a Ghibli that are vaguely Chrysler based. Yeah, including the uh, in-car entertainment apparently is shared Viewpoint, with them. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it's not as good as the Chrysler stuff. The Chrysler yeah. stuff's not bad. Um, yeah. Well, okay. So Maserati's not perhaps on the right track, but could potentially be at could some be. point, maybe. I mean, I sure. Know. Make a new V6 with these new CVCC heads on it from Honda from 19... 
Yeah. Great. We should tell that story. This has been episode seven. I think we have. We did many times. (laughs) Episode 71. Don't give a number. Then we have to put these out. Oh, we were supposed to do something. We mentioned it. Oh, I bet we already mentioned at the beginning, which we haven't recorded yet. Whatever. Do not forget. That we're going to do a QA and a episode of the Carmudgeon Show. So submit your questions to video questions, video questions at Haggerty.com. At Haggerty.com. Uh, and we will do our best to answer them. Ignore. We'll probably just ignore most of them. But if they're good questions, we'll answer them. Yes. So uh, one forthcoming episode will be Q&A. So video questions at Haggerty.com. Uh, this has been the Carmudgeon Show. That is a hyphen and I'm a Jason. I'm adjacent to a hyphen. <laughs> Stuck. Deet, deet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>